All right, you guys sounded good today. Everybody doing good? Looking good. Thank you for braving the cold weather. We call that the frozen chosen. That's who we are this weekend. <laughs> but you warmed it up in here. That was great worship today. And I hope you've had a good week as we come to one week down on our 21-day uh, focus on fasting and prayer. And man, as I look out, I, I'm, just, I'm just believing the rest of you campuses are slimming these days, right? Uh, Galesburg and Chile and Canton and Princeton. We welcome you guys. Come on, let's give it up here at the Peoria campus for those who are with us. And, and you know, before I go any further, uh, my time of fasting and prayer is made all the better by the fact that Susan and I became proud Papa and Mimi to our fifth granddaughter yesterday morning at 530. There she is, John, Jonathan and Michaela. My son John that you know from this stage, he, this is their little daughter, Joanna Lee. And she tipped the scales at 9.7 pounds. So I thought, man, first thing I'm teaching her is all about fasting, you know? <laughs> Not, not really. She's a beautiful little girl, and, and uh, I know we're going to have a good time with her. So just pray for Jonathan Michael. It sounds like everything's good with mom and dad. So uh, what an exciting time for us. But speaking of fasting, I, I hope no one's been upset with me this week as you've been crunching on your veggies and sipping your water and, and walking past those donuts that are calling your name. Don't you find it? It, it? It's so true that the moment you decide to fast from whatever the food may be, that food will start kind of just coming after you. Come on, Cal, you know you want some, right? That's how, that's how it works. And think about it. Now, this is part of the power of fasting. Part of its mission in your life is to uncover those things that control you. It reveals what controls us. It and then combined with prayer helps us to blow up and break off those bondages in our lives. And not only is that true in our physical lives, so many times we can, we can have all kinds of things going haywire in our physical lives because there's something, some kind of comfort food controlling us. While it's true in our physical lives, it can be true in a lot of other areas of lives. And we're we'll be talking about one of those important areas where many people could use a turnaround, and that is their finances. Now, we all know that money is a powerful thing. Zig Ziglar, one of my favorite motivational speakers, and when I got my right voice at night, I can do him, you know. But Zig, Zig uh, used to say, now, money isn't everything, but it is somewhat close to oxygen. <laughs> and it, it, he, you know what he's saying there. If your finances are in order, you, you tend to breathe a whole lot easier in every other area of your life. But the worst things are financially, you feel the chokehold. You feel the chokehold on your life. There's nothing worse than financial bondage. It hangs over everything in our lives like a black cloud. It makes us feel defeated and hopeless. It, it leads to fights and arguments in our marriage, doesn't it? That's the number one reason that couples break up. Financial stress. And if you're feeling the pressure of financial bondage today, wouldn't it be great to know some financial freedom? To have a turnaround in your finances. And I want to help you get on that path today. You, you start working on these steps I'm going to give you today, and things may turn around faster than you think. But we all understand money's incessant whisper in our ear, promising the sweet fulfillment of instant gratification if we'll only spend now, borrow now, go into debt now, feel good now, and worry about how to pay for it later. Right? Think of how, that's what it says to us. Think, think of how nice you look in those, those clothes, driving that new car, living that new house, whatever the next new purchase is for you. There's nothing that feels better than instant gratification, and nobody wants to fast from that. That's really what fasting is all about, causing us to say, you know what? I'm going to forgo something right now so I can get that reward that's out there for me. I'll never forget a battle I lost to that whisper of instant gratification when I was only 13 years old and it ruined my day so badly. I said, I never want to feel like this again when it comes to money. I mean, it woke me up early and I knew that I could easily 
lose control in a, in a lot of different areas. But I want to tell you, I was 13 years old. Our church youth group was at Kings Island in Cincinnati, Ohio for the day. And I had brought along 10 bucks for spending money and meals for the day. And guys, back in those days, $10 grew a whole lot further than it goes today. You know, if a hamburger costs 50 cents and a Coke costs 25 cents, think about that. You could go quite a ways on $10. And so I had plenty for the day. I, I felt like a rich man, man, just kind of walking, strutting around that park, you know, $10 in my pocket. And about 10 o'clock in the morning, we were going to be there about 6 o'clock that evening, but it's 10, and I come across one of those arcade games where you win one of those great big old stuffed animals, and I thought, I, I need to get that for my girlfriend, whoever she was that week. But uh, <laughs> I got going on wanting to get one of those stuffed animals. I started feeding that old arcade game. First 25 cents, another 25 cents, 25 cents, 25 cents. I lost my first dollar. And I thought, man, I, I don't know. Why, why I want to get one of those things. So, okay, one more dollar. Blew through that dollar. And you know what I said? Well, I got plenty. This, I, if I don't get it by the end of three dollars, I walk away. I blew through three dollars. And then number four was calling me. Right? Five dollars. Six dollars. Guys, can I tell you, this 13-year-old under the control of that instant gratification bug blew that entire $10 at 10 o'clock in the morning and never did win one of those stuffed animals. I want to tell you, I was walking around the, that uh, uh, Kings Island the, the rest of that day with just this awful feeling in my gut like cursing myself, beating myself up for how stupid I could be to, to just blow all my money on that stupid game, right? And I mean, I, I was swearing to myself that never again was I going to let instant gratification make a fool of me. But we all know that's easier said than done, don't we? None of us has ever very far from falling for the deceptive promises of instant gratification, particularly with regard to our finances. So I want to speak to this issue today from a rather obscure passage in the Old Testament that just really grabbed my attention several years ago during our 21-day fast, and it illustrates a principle that has drastic implications for our lives if we want to experience God's blessing on our finances, and you'll see the connection to fasting. Because fasting reveals what controls us and breaks the bondage what controls us. And some of us need that in our finances today. This is a story that took place between the twin brothers, Jacob and Esau, sons of Isaac and Rebekah, and grandsons of Abraham. As you, th you think about the patriarchs, the Bible talks about the patriarchs of our faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob was a twin brother with Esau, but Jacob is the one that God changed his name to Israel. So when we talk about Israel, we go to Israel, we're, we're really walking on ground that's named after him, one, one of our patriarchs, all right? The Bible tells us that Esau, the firstborn, was his dad's favorite. He was a hunter, a man of the op open country, a, a real man's man who just loved to be outdoors looking for something to shoot. And, and his dad loved to eat whatever he brought back. The Bible also tells us that Jacob, on the other hand, was something of a mama's boy and quiet, loved to hang out around the house, help her in the kitchen, knew how to cook. He probably would have run a restaurant or something like that, you know. But we pick up the story in Genesis 25, and I, I want to just take you through the story, and then I'll explain some things here. So once when Jacob was cooking some stew, there he is in the kitchen, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. It was a lentil stew, we'll find out later. It apparently had a red, red tint to it. He said, I'm famished. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Hang on to that when we tell you about a birthright in a little bit. But this is Jacob, you know. Esau has the birthright because he came out first. The Bible tells us that Jacob came out of his mama's womb Grasping the heel. So he was only a couple seconds behind. Grasping Esau's heel. Now, Jacob means he grasps the heel. Also, it means he deceives. And Jacob was a great deceiver until God got a hold of him. But here you see him in action. 
His brother is famished. Sell me your birthright. I'll give you some soup. Right? So look at Esau. Boy, king stomachs on the throne here. Look, I'm about to die. What good is the birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me first. You know, he's saying, I know you well enough. No, about the time I give you that soup, you can say, just kidding. I'm going to keep the birthright. No, swear to me. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. And then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright, dot, 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 for a bowl of soup. Many people are doing that today. Now, because our culture doesn't operate by birthrights today, you, you need to understand that there were incredible financial ramifications of trading in a birthright for a bowl of soup. A birthright was a privilege or possession to which the firstborn son was entitled by birth in Bible times. The firstborn son enjoyed a favored position. His birthright included a double portion of his father's assets upon death. Isaac's got another 30, 40 years. Esau's sitting there, I need something now, who cares, right? But upon death, think about this. If Isaac was worth $3 million, he's probably worth more than that. He's a very wealthy man. But if he's worth $3 million and you open the will after his death, it would say Esau gets $2 million, Jacob gets one. I don't know how you feel about that today. A lot of people fight over what they find in the will, but I'm saying this is just the way it was. If you're the firstborn, you get double portion of everything. And it would have said the same thing about all possessions. It would have said the same thing about cattle. Esau gets two to every one of Jacob's. That's just the way the birthright worked. So you know what? It was good to be the firstborn, even if you beat your brother out by 15 seconds. Now, the inheritance rights of the firstborn were protected by law, so the father couldn't give his, benef his benefits to a younger son even if he wanted to. The only way the firstborn could ever lose his birthright is if he himself decided he didn't want it and therefore gave it or sold it to his brother. So in that moment, Esau was essentially saying, just give me a $3 cup of soup now, and what the heck, you can have the extra million 30 years from now. Who cares? Talk about selling out your future for a moment of instant gratification. During a quiet time with God one day, the story just kind of jumped off the page, and God showed me several important implications from this passage that are germane to our topic today and to our 21-day journey of fasting. Number one being that the, the power and importance of fasting. Now, come on. Uh, you, you know how it is. About, about the minute we've been eight hours without food, we'll say something like, man, I'm starving. Right? You've said that before. I'm starving. No, you're not. You could go another 25 days without food and it wouldn't hurt you. Uh, here's Esau. Man, I'm starving, famished. You know what? He, he's just, he demonstrates, you know, old King's stomach was really in control of his life. When I first heard that, where I read that, the, the author said, if you don't know who King's stomach is, look down and introduce yourself. <laughs> Try to, roll, try to control your life. Fasting brings that under control. But you see, because Esau's appetite was out of control, he was willing to give away all the blessings of his future for a two-minute moment of instant gratification. And where, guys, just look around. And we see that happening all over the place today. People will throw away their high-paying jobs for a moment of instant gratification. People will throw away their marriages and their families for a moment of instant gratification. People will throw away their reputations, their character for a moment of instant gratification. People will throw away their health for a moment of instant gratification. All for a bowl of soup. Satisfy the appetite. Part of what God is wanting to work in our lives through these days of fasting is to bring all of our appetites, represented by our stomach, because, man, when everything's good, we feel good in here. So many times we try to live for feeling good in here. God said, I want you to bring that under my control. 
so that we don't continue to surrender our future blessings to the pleasure of the moment. That's part of, that's part of fasting, walking past that steak, that donut, that candy bar that's calling your name in the moment because you're pursuing a greater reward down the road, be it closeness with God, a deeper relationship with Him, release from bondage of some kind, better health, or, or whatever turnaround you're going after. Think about it. You're walking past a bowl of soup right now. So you can get to a greater inheritance. Secondly, God showed me that this demon of instant gratification is that, I say demon because really I believe it is pow- empowered by demons. This demon of instant gratification is the root of much of our bondage today in so many areas of our, of our lives. And at no place has it robbed more people of their birthright than it has in the area of their finances. Now, Dave Ramsey, author of The Materials We Use for Our Class, Financial Peace University, a class that's coming up. I'm going to tell you about it in a moment, but some of you will have seen some of these videos I show today, maybe, but I'm really showing them to those of you who are going, I don't know who Dave Dave Ramsey is, never been to Financial Peace University. I want to whet your appetite because your next step out of this place today might be to go to Financial Peace University, and I want you to know you're going to something really, really good. He paints here in this video a humorous picture of what this bondage looks like in so many lives and marriages today. Let's watch. Here's another one. Look at this one. You have to look real carefully. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. What happens to us when we get out of school? We get married, right? No, this is not marriage. <laughs> some, some of us got married. Some of you are still single. That's either way is fine. But we get out, we get started, right? And we got a little bit of a student loan debt maybe. Maybe we got a little bit of a, a MasterCard debt. Sharon and I got started like this, and we started off broke. I mean, you guys started off broke. We were driving a 1902 Pinto. <laughs> For you young people, that's a car, not a bean. And that's back about the time those Pintos were blowing up, the exploding car. Anybody remember that? Well, Sharon's driving the Pinto. So my friends are making fun of me. I bet you got good life insurance on the new bride. (laughs) So I got all embarrassed and went and bought my wife a brand new car I wanted. Yeah, some of the ladies got that one. And we went down to the electronics store to get a new television because the one we got at the garage sale, we were watching like this. And I got a new television, only it was a stereo television. So I had to get a stereo with great big old honking speakers, right? And a big old, uh, a big old entertainment center to put it on, right? And, and so now we're eating off a card table, living in a one-bedroom apartment, but we have a stereo system that'll shake an eight-block area. <laughs> and of course, we put it on 90 days, same as, yes. which means I didn't pay for it ever, hardly took forever to get that silly thing paid off, but I'm a finance major. I wanted to get that free money. Right. (laughs) Doesn't work that way. And then we've been married about, I don't know, six or eight minutes, and people start coming over to our house going, oh, you're a renter. You can't be a renter. Renters are evil. You don't want to be a renter. You want to own real estate. Don't throw your money away on rent. Buy a house, buy a house, buy a house, buy a house, buy a house. I mean, we've been married, I don't know, three or four minutes before this started. Buy a house, buy a house, buy a house. You got to buy a house, you got to buy a house, you got to buy a house. Y'all have the pressure to buy a house? Everybody's, you got to buy a house. I mean, you don't want to be a renter. You got to buy a house. Everybody knows you got to buy a house. Well, I want you to get a house. I've got no problem with you getting a house. I just don't want your house to get you. And when broke people buy houses, it makes them broker. That's why they call them mortgage brokers. (laughs) But we, we went and bought a house because everybody said you got to buy a house. We put nothing down because that's how much we had to put down. Back in those days, they called it creative financing. And we bought a home about five blocks over from where I grew up. The borrower is slave to the lender. Larry Burkett used to say that we spend the first five to seven years of our marriage trying to attain the same standard of living as our parents. Only it took them 35 years to get there. We were living in the same neighborhood as mom and dad, driving a better car than mom and dad, and for sure had a better stereo than mom and dad. (laughs) 
The problem is lots of couples look like this in North America today. 52% of the marriages now end in divorce. The number one cause of divorce, financial problems. The number one cause of divorce big time in the first seven years of marriage, financial problems. You know why people get divorced when they're like this? Their leg gets tired. And I wanted you to see that today, just to whet your appetite for the upcoming Financial Peace University that will be offered at two different times in Peoria campus. Just a little commercial here, okay? Because again, some of you are going to move from here. I hope this is your next step. So Saturdays at 4 o'clock. We're going to give you a couple different times so that it hits hopefully more of you. Saturday at 4 o'clock starting January 27th. And Thursdays at 6 o'clock starting February 1st. Also our Galesburg campus... Uh, We'll be offering it starting Wednesday, January 31st at 6.30. Guys, it's the best $99 investment you'll ever make. And we do ask you to invest because we want you to have some skin in the game. All right? And that covers the cost of materials that are worth every cent of that $99 and gives you access to a multitude of Dave Ramsey's online resources. Also, child care is available. So you, you can register online at northwoods.church slash FPU. And guys, if you need a financial turnaround, then your next step is to take that class, okay? So be getting that information down, go to that class. But I showed you that video today as a vivid description of the kind of bondage that instant gratification will lead us into. It's just not so funny when the new flat screen and the new car and the new house and the new couch and the new clothes are causing us to fight over the fact that there's always too much month left at the end of our paycheck. Worse yet, it's what it's doing to rob us of the future blessings that could be ours were we not selling out our financial birthright right now for a bowl of soup. Some of you might be asking, well, what, what do you mean by our financial birthright? Well, the neat thing for all of us who have decided to follow Jesus Christ is that we are co-heirs with Jesus and we get in on all of the benefits and blessings of the firstborn. God plays no favorites with his children and part of our birthright is financial blessing. Don't shy away from that. Just because some people on TV you hear go, oh, that prosperity doctrine there. Yeah, there's some that's a little skewed out there, but that doesn't take away from the fact that God wants to prosper you. But if he's going to, we can't be throwing it away for a bowl of soup. I want to just show you very quickly what it is God wants you to know, what I call my financial birthright as a child of God. First is to have a joyful, contented, thankful spirit with regard to my finances. Do you have a joyful generous or je joyful, contented, and thankful spirit with regard to your finances today? It's part of your birth, right? And to be free from the control of money in my life. I'm not under bondage. I'm not just living for instant gratification. Look at this here. First Timothy 6, 6 to 9. But godliness with contentment is great gain for brought nothing into the world and we will take nothing out of it. Isn't that true? You're not taking anything with you. Very wealthy man died one day and two guys were talking about it. you. Did you ever hear how much he left? His friend said, all of it. You're, you're, you're going to leave all of it too. And then he says, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Here's the bondage. People who want to get rich, got to just have more, right? Fall into temptation, a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires. There's instant gratification that plunge men into ruin and destruction. My financial birthright is a child of God to experience supernatural supply in times of need. Because sometimes you'll say, man, I, I feel like I, I, I have a real need here and maybe I'm, I'm ready to go into debt to go get, no, 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 no. Give God a chance. I've seen him work this verse many, many times. Philippians 4.19, my God is able to meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Give him a chance. My financial birthright. I love this to experience supernatural increase as I obey God. Very important. Can't be living backwards. Can't be totally outside of God's will in your finances and be asking him to bless you and think that he will as I obey God in my finances. 
Look at this verse, guys. You might want to get this one down and memorize it. 2 Corinthians 9, 10. Pray it back to God because he's the one who said it. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower, that farmer needs seed. Boy, I got to trust God to give me seed and bread for food. He might, got a chance. No, no, no. What's, what's the word? He, come on. He will. Not just supply, but what's this word? Increase. See, God of increase. He'll supply and increase your store of seed. That means he'll give you more. And will. There's the other. That's that word again. Enlarge your harvest of righteousness. Part of your birthright as a child of God. My financial birthright is to have not just enough, is to have more than enough so I can contribute generously to God's kingdom work. And again, 2 Corinthians 9, 8, great chapter on giving. God is able, and on, on having and giving, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, doesn't put the period there. <laughs> no, you got more than you need. You're going to be able to abound in every good work. And it's talking about people who have enough, not just for themselves, that they just give away because they have more. Part of my financial birthright as a child of God, to have heaven reveal that God was first in my finances. I don't know, guys. It might be 30, 40 years from now or whatever it is for you. I hope I get another 30 years at least, maybe 40, whatever. I'm going to see the reality then. If I don't throw it away for a bowl of soup now. You see? That birthright is worth millions. And I can't promise that if you do things God's way, it will lead to your becoming a millionaire. I can't promise that. But what I do know is that financial turnarounds only happen when one first becomes a realionaire. It's a word I saw years ago in a book. I actually did a series years ago on that, but I've never forgotten the word, a realionaire. Listen, don't focus on becoming a millionaire. Focus on becoming a realionaire. And when you do, boy, you're going to be walking under God's blessing. It may make you a millionaire. It may not, but you know what? You, you won't notice because you'll have everything you need and more because you're a realionaire. What is that? Oh, didn't give you that verse. But a realionaire is someone who manages his financial world in accordance with God's wisdom and understanding such that it leads to true biblical prosperity, which I define as I have everything I need to joyfully and generously fulfill God's purposes for my life. That's prosperity. And if you're going to get there, there are six important decisions that every Realionaire has to make to secure their birthright rather than settling for a bowl of soup. I'm going to rapid fire these today. Decision number one is get real about who you're going to serve. Get real about who you're going to serve. It does start there. Because if you don't get this one right, nothing else is going to fall into line for you. See, Jesus talked about money not as evil in itself, but as influenced by demonic powers. He called it mammon. That, that seeks our allegiance, mammon. Mammon through money poses as a rival God, makes us think if we can only get more, if we just have all the money we need, we'll be more fulfilled, we'll be more secure, more contented, more whatever. And he said in Matthew 6, 24, he said, you cannot serve both God. And really he had other words for money. That word in the Greek is mammon. Can't do it. You can serve God or you can serve mammon, but you can't do both at the same time. And the way you crush the influence of mammon in your life is by putting God on the throne of your life and managing your money God's way. Now, if you've never given your heart and life to Jesus, then start there because if he's not on the throne of your life, then some other God is. And you're going to sell out your eternity for a bowl of soup right now. 
But you open your life to him. You ask him to forgive your sin, to invite, and you invite him in and you say, Lord, from now on, you're going to be my one and only God. You're going to be my first love, the priority of my life. I now surrender my life and everything in my life to you, including my wallet. And I claim you as the rightful owner of all that I have. So you get your, right, your heart right with him and all the rest will follow. It'd be great for all of us who are believers even to make a recommitment here today because of how easy it is to forget that if we've given our lives to Jesus, he also owns our wallets and bank accounts and everything in them. We're not taking it with us. Doesn't belong to us. He gave it to us to manage and we wouldn't have it had he not given it to us or made it possible for us to gather it. It'd be great if you do this as families. I mean, think about doing this around your, your table. You know, you come together for your Daniel meal or whatever you're doing, you know. Maybe one time this week with your families. Those who got young kids, have them bring their piggy banks. Dad, take out your wallet representing the possessions of his family. Mom, your purse. Put them there around the, you know, on the table and just have a time of teaching your kids about what it means to surrender. To say, God, I declare you as Lord over all of my financial resources. You're the owner, I'm the manager, and I pledge to obey you in my finances. And when you're doing that, you can say, and I now claim my financial birthright in Jesus' name. But you gotta get real about who you're going to serve. Secondly, every millionaire knows this one as well. You gotta make this decision. You gotta get real about debt. And I, I, I love this one. Some of you, again, have seen it, but let's just watch Dave as he helps us understand how radical we've got to get with debt in our lives if we're going to break free from its clutches and not sacrifice our financial future for a bowl of soup. Let's watch the screens. Listen, there's 31 Proverbs. If you read one a day, you get your little spiritual vitamin, right? And, and if you read Proverbs over and over again and understand it, you'll have a master's degree in finance. It's in there. It's unbelievable. It's the book of wisdom, right? And so I'm reading through Proverbs, and I have Proverbs 6, 1 through 7. And it says, if you've signed surety, my son, do this. Now, that's old English Bible talk for if you've gotten into debt, here's the plan. Now, I had a spiritual experience with God a few years ago. I discovered God is smarter than me. <laughs> and so when I see a formula like that pop up in front of me, my ears perk up. If you've gotten into debt, do this. And I got my, I'm like, oh, here it is. Here's the biblical answer for how to get out of debt. Wow, I'm ready. It says, give no sleep to your eyes, no slumber to your eyelids, and deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, a bird from the hand of the fowler. Now, some of you are very reverent in your interaction with God, and he tolerates me. It's called grace. And, and so... I'm sitting there reading this, and I'm like, you were going to tell me like, how to get out of debt and how to get people out of debt, and you give me animal metaphors. <laughs> what am I supposed to do with gazelles and birds? Really? Come on. Nothing. Crickets. Can't hear a thing, right? So that night, he answered my prayer. I was scanning the channels, and I hit the Discovery Channel, and there were the gazelles. They were out there gazelling around. <laughs> and I'm like, Hey, I was just reading about you guys. Deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, a bird from the hand of the fowler. This is how you get out of debt. I thought, that's pretty cool. And, and you know the Discovery Channel was not there if, if the gazelles were there by themselves, don't you? You know someone else was there looking for lunch in all the right places, don't you? You know? And the gazelles, I don't know if you know this, they have a cheetah detector behind their ear and they go, Gee! Because the gazelles know that they cannot outrun the cheetah. The cheetah is the fastest mammal on dry land. He can go from zero to 47 miles an hour in four leaps. The gazelle cannot outrun the cheetah. And we had to slow this down so I don't have time to talk. <laughs> this bad cat is seriously fast. And these gazelles, man, they are running for their lives. That's what they're doing. Look, he picked out a college student. Hey, kid. <laughs> build up your FICO score. Hey, kid, you'll never get a cell phone if you don't have a credit score. Come here. Come here, kid. Come here, kid. I got a free t-shirt for you, kid. Come here. Let me tell you, God says this is how you get out of debt. You got to run for your life. You got to put it in gear. 
You got to run, 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 run. You got to bust it. You got to cross it. You got to go like your life depends on it. <laughs> I love that one. That's so good. But you know, that, that's how real you got to get about debt. Get real about what, who you're going to serve. Get real about debt. Get real, decision number three, about limits. You can't everything. You don't need everything you see. You will do far better limiting yourself to what you can afford than buying what you can't afford than wearing yourself out because of the worry and financial bondage hanging over your head. You need to discover what Camille Adcock discovered when she writes, she's one of Dave's students, what, what a financial and emotional mess I was in. I had a master's degree from the financial arena. I was over $150,000 in debt. I was one of those broke financial professors. But hey, I had a lot of fun stuff, only I could enjoy it because of the amount of debt I was under. So I decided to make a change. I sold my motor coach. I got on a written budget for the first time in my life. And then she says, to make a long story short, I've worked my way out of 116000 of that debt. And then I love this line. I don't have as many toys now, but I have a lot of peace. Why? Because she's learned to live within the limits of her life. Can I tell you? That's where rest is found. That's where peace is found. And that's also where your financial future is found. You're not selling out for a bowl of soup. Decision number four, get real about a budget. Get real about a budget. A budget isn't designed to be your master, but it is a scoreboard to help you plan and know where your money's going. I have no idea how Susan and I would have made it over the years if not for our commitment to living on a budget, living inside that budget, even when it meant, hey, we got $20 for the next two weeks for entertainment. That means meals out or movies or whatever. And maybe the first two days, we spent the 20. And somebody comes along, hey, you guys want to go out to a movie? You want to go, well, what do we do? We don't have any money in our... No, we just had to live that way. Now that our kids are grown and on their own, colleges are paid for, houses are paid for, we have a whole lot more discretionary spending money than we used to have. But even so, here's what hasn't changed. We haven't just started dumping our money into one big slush fund that we dip out of whenever we need something or want something. No, we have, same thing, categorized spreadsheet with at least 20 different categories with a certain amount of each check going into each category. We've been running our household that way for 36 years. And believe me, friends, we feel at peace because of knowing where our money's going. And don't you dare think that we didn't hear that same whisper as you hear, those things that say, well, hey, there's a great sale on and you can never get it quite at this price again. You know, man, we could get that new couch or that new car or that whatever that new thing may be. You've heard that. Guys, here's my word to you. If it crushes the budget, which you can only know if you're on one or you have one, if it crushes the budget, I don't care how good a deal it is, it ain't worth it. You're not going to enjoy it because you're going to be living under bondage. So if you need help figuring out how to put a budget together, how to live on a budget, get to FPU and let Dave help you. Decision number five, get real about saving. And obviously, if you don't do the rest of this stuff, you're probably not going to have anything saved. You've been spending everything you got on a bowl of soup. Selling out your financial future. So this is why the wisest man in the world, Solomon, said, Proverbs 13 to 11, he who gathers money little by little makes it grow. Savings accumulated little by little over the long haul can lead to a lot down the road if you don't spend everything you get. Trust me, I know how hard it can be when you're raising the kids and bills are coming due every month and it feels like you need every cent just to make ends meet, but we always worked in our house at saving a little because that was number two on our list of financial priorities. You've got to put a little bit away. What was number one? Decision number six, get real about giving. Now, really, once you decide who you're going to serve, this one becomes kind of an automatic deal, hopefully. And here's what I'm saying. If you don't get real about giving, you're never going to have enough. And you're probably never going to get those other things in order. 
But if you get real about giving, it'll help you bring everything else in order. And you will have the joy of knowing I am living with God on the throne of my life, and He's in control of my finances. So no matter what flows to your life financially, if God's first place in your life, give Him the first 10% right off the top. I hear people say, well, I tithe. I tithe 3%. No, tithe doesn't mean 3%. Tithe means 10%. Not 2%, not 5%. You just give him the first 10%. Right off the top. That's what the Bible calls a tithe. This is the pathway to blessing. Again, wisest man in the Bible, wisest man in the world, Solomon, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your crops. Stop there. Every Jewish person reading that would know what honor and first fruits means. It means I give right off the top and I give him a tithe means if I had 10 bushels of corn that I picked as first fruits, God got the first bushel. When the first lamb was born, I didn't wait around to see how many more lambs are going to be born. I gave God the first. Didn't matter whether I have second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. I didn't wait till the seventh one to see if I had enough to give to God. See? And that's why if you want your income to be blessed, give him the first part of your paycheck as often you receive income which simply means don't wait around until the end of the paycheck to see if you have enough because I guarantee you, you won't. And I've talked to you this many, many times. Here's the first fruit principle. When the first is blessed, so is the rest, which means if you start honoring God with the first fruits of your income, the rest is going to be blessed. You probably have more. But if you make yourself, you keep listening to the voice of mammon and living for him, probably never going to have enough. Now listen to me, this is, this is not an issue of your salvation. This is an issue of you walking in freedom and coming into your financial inheritance. So as I said, don't wait around to the end of your paycheck. Take it off the top. And I would challenge you then to begin to order everything in your life around returning a tithe to the Lord. Start with that right off the top. The rest of your, then the rest of what you have left, that's your living expenses, and that's what you determine on that 90%. Here's what determines whether I have enough to buy that car, that house, those clothes, blah, 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 without taking what really belongs to God. Let me just give you a diagram on that real quick. Oops, going the wrong way. Here. This is what bowl of soup living looks like. Because my life is out of order and God is not first place, I just spend whatever I get for whatever I need and probably never have enough. And if, in fact, I have a little bit left down here, I might be able to throw God two, two bucks in the offering plate and feel good. Huh. Dave, I'm really caring about him. Right? That's bowl of soup living. You're never going to have enough. Your, your mammon's whispering to you. Here's birthright living. Just give God first. OTT, off the top. The tithe. Susan and I have worked on it, and that, that's really training wheels. It's not a big thing. Very, very easy to give the 10%. We've given it all our lives, no matter what our income has been. Very easy. Why? Because we lived within the limits of what we had left. And you know what God generally does when we put him first? He gives the increase. This thing starts to expand out this way. <laughs> and what we do in our living, because I said we had a second priority, whatever we could. Sometimes that line wasn't very long. We move it over. That was what we would save. And then inside of here, we would decide what we could afford. That's birthright living. And we have experienced all of God's promises in our lives. So, guys, just give God the first 10% off the top because the Bible says the tithe belongs to the Lord. In fact, it says if you keep that for yourself, God says you're ripping him off. <laughs> That's why it says return the tithe. It doesn't say give the tithe. It says return the tithe. Why? Because it belongs to him. If I come borrow your lawnmower and don't bring it back, or when I do bring it back, here, I, I'm going to give this to you now. You say, give it to me. Or, Isn't it mine? I think you're returning it. See? 
And my own conviction is just as the tithe went to the synagogue storehouse to take care of ministry, so the tithe should come first to the work of God's kingdom through the local church, and then any extra you want to give is an offering over and above to other things. And guys, I'm telling you, every church in this country, around the world, function this way under their birthright, we would have more than enough to not only do what God wants done here, we would be spilling out to all kinds of stuff, feeding the poor, planting churches, whatever. It would. So if you're a follower of Jesus and not a tither, I would just say, you know what, get your finances in order and become one. In fact, just make a commitment to start, because I, I would tell people, if, I, if my finances were out of order, I wouldn't wait till they were in order to start tithing. I'd start tithing and know that God was going to help me get them in order. In fact, 97% of the people who tithe, and I haven't found a person who tithe that regrets it. Not yet. 97% of people who tithe, you know how they got there? They, they didn't think they could. They just said, all right, starting now, I'm going to. 10% right off the top. Very few ever get there if they just try to gradually do it. But again, I want, to, I want you to hear me going out of here, guys. I'm, I'm giving you the, the birthright. Don't get under guilt if you're not there. This is not an issue of salvation. But I hope your heart is such, because God knows your heart and he loves your heart. I hope your heart is such that God, help me get there. I don't want to keep living for a bowl of soup. So what I'm saying is you've got to get real about your finances if you're ever going to enter into the fullness of your birthright. So make these decisions today, then manage them day by day. And as you do, you can just bank on the fact that you'll be living in the blessing of your financial birthright instead of selling out for the instant gratification of a bowl of soup. Amen? Amen? I want you to stand right now. I want to pray for you for a minute before we go. And this prayer is going to go in two directions. Just bow your head and your heart. There's some of you here as followers of Jesus that it would just be good, probably for all of us, to just rededicate ourselves to him again today. And just to say to him, Lord Jesus, in your name today I ask you to bless my life. I declare you as Lord over all that I am and all that I have. And I do surrender all to you. That's my heart, Lord. And God, I would ask you if there's any place where the power of instant gratification is at work in my life, and particularly in my finances, bring that under control. And help me to obey you, Lord. Don't let me sell my financial future for a bowl of soup. There's some of you who maybe don't know Jesus today, and if that's you, here's the truth. You're like Esau, and you're saying, oh, that's 30 or 40 years down the road. Who knows when I'm going to die? i got lots of, lots of life in front of me. You really don't know how much life you have in front of you, but there's an eternity that Jesus Christ already paid for. He says, that's your birthright too. I died for you to bring you there. You really, do you really want to sacrifice that for a bowl of soup? instant gratification of the now rather than saying, God, I'm, I'm following you. And I just believe God's spoken to some hearts today, maybe at our other campuses too or even online. Would you bow your head and pray with us right now? And if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus and could say, man, I get in on the benefits of the firstborn because I belong to him. Invite him in your life right now. Just say something like this, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and I want to surrender my life to you right now. I don't want to miss out on my birthright for a bowl of soup, a living for myself for the rest of my life. So I ask you to come into my life this day. I confess my sin. I ask you to forgive my sin. And from this moment, you be Lord of my life. I confess that you are Lord of my life, all that I am and all that I have. Lead me and guide me and direct me from this day forward, I want to live for you. And I thank you now that you have given me that birthright because I've surrendered to you today in Jesus' name. And friend, if you prayed that prayer, I want you out the yes, there'll be yes packets available, all of our campuses. 
uh, here at the Peoria campus. Pick one of these up. It's a new, new believer's Bible. This is a way of indicating that you said yes to Jesus if you prayed to receive him today. Thank you for being here. Would you Come on, just give him some praise today for a great, week, a great weekend. Keep on, keep on leaning into that fast, okay? Have a great week, and we'll see you back here next weekend. If you need prayer for anything, come on down, and the team will be here. Those of you watching online, thank you so much again for joining us. And listen, if you said yes to Jesus, I think there's a, uh, some way of indicating that as well today, and, and we'll get some, some of those new believer Bibles out to you as well, all right? We're so grateful that you tune in week by week. We hope God spoke to your heart today, touched your heart today, and as you continue to fast with us, uh, we're praying for turnarounds in your life. Hope to see you back here next week. God bless you.